He ain't got no business being in here. This is God's house. And he's off his limits. And so uh, let's all bow our head and go to the Lord in prayer right now. Our Heavenly Father, as we bow in your presence this morning, Lord, it's so good to be saved. Lord, it's wonderful that, Lord, we'll never have to walk that old rugged way alone anymore. God, you said you'd never leave us nor forsake us. I pray, our Heavenly Father, now as we'd come to this time, that you'd move back any hindering power. Lord, wake us up. Get us ready. God, use us for thy glory this morning. Lord God, we realize that souls are in the balance. And Lord, we realize that some life may be in danger here this morning. I pray for them, whoever they are, Lord, that you'd speak to them, God, by the power of your Spirit. We can't do it, Lord, but you can. And I'm asking you in the name of Jesus, the name that's above every name, not according to our righteousness, Lord, but according to your great and abundant mercy, that you'd look down upon us and use us this morning for thy name's honor and power and glory. And I pray, dear Lord, as we'd open the word of God, that you would help us to rightly divide the word of truth. Lord, that we'd say just exactly what you won't say if there be that one of those here this morning who's not saved, I pray that you'd save them today before they leave this place. Oh, dear God, I pray you'd do it. Lord, God, may the Holy Spirit come in and help right away in this service right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, if you have your Bibles this morning, open to the book of Revelation, chapter 13. The book of Revelation, chapter 13. Uh, we're going to get... Uh, message off our heart this morning and tonight that, that's been bothering us and on our heart for some time now and we keep putting it off and waiting because uh, uh, I'm not that really that type of preacher but we're going to be uh, preaching what the Lord's given us for this morning in the book of Revelation chapter 13 now you've heard a lot about in the past few years especially uh, things that people call the Antichrist and the mark of the beast and you've heard about 666, and you've heard this stuff, and it's real popular these days in the time that we're living in. And so we're going to turn to God's Word. And I feel like we ought to take a service or two out for this purpose and turn to God's Word and see just what the Bible says about the Antichrist. And so we're going to be looking at him this morning, and the Lord willing, also tonight. And we've been doing a lot of studying, collecting a lot of books and material, and piling it all together, so... You probably won't be able to take much notes on this, but tapes will be available if you'd like to have one. Uh, we want you to uh, look at Revelation chapter 13 and verse 1, and this will be uh, a little bit slower than the way, way we usually go because we've got a lot of information to give you. Now, if you're, you're here this morning and you don't, uh, have never heard, you never knew the story of how Jesus is coming back, it's going to go like this in a nutshell. One of these days, it may be today, it may be tomorrow, it may be next week, all God's children is going to hear a shout. And we don't know how long this is going to be. It may be two, ten years from now. It may be five years from now. It may be five seconds from now. But God's children is going to hear a shout. And the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. And uh, the dead in Christ rise first. We which are alive and remain shall be called up to meet them, to meet the Lord in the air. So if Jesus was to decide to come right now, we'd hear a big holler and scream, and I'd hear my name, and you'd hear your name, and brother, before you could bat your eye, we'd go out on top of this building and be gone. Now, I can imagine, I've always wondered just seeing the world getting littler and littler and littler and just going bye-bye, bye-bye, bye-bye. That's the way I've always thought about it. Goodbye, cruel world, goodbye. Good riddance, too, amen? I've not got any strings tied on me to where I'm... I'm so worried about my career and all of that junk. I ain't got no plans, brother, that I couldn't drop this morning if the Lord said come. All right? Now, in the book of Revelation, chapter 13, we find something that happens after we're gone. We believe it right. We write that's going to happen after we're gone. Everything from Revelation 4.1 to Revelation 19.11 is happens while me and you's gone. We go up in Revelation 4.1. We come back down in Revelation 19.11. And we've got a lot of scripture verses to give you. You might try to write something down uh, because I want to get all this in on one Sunday because a lot of times we talk about stuff like this, about how the congregation kind of looks at you like that. And so I want to preach where people can understand me, and that's how come I don't go into a lot of these things sometimes. I'd rather speak a few words that people can understand than 10,000 words that they couldn't. Amen. And so this morning we're going to try to be brief and to the point and bring you a message on the subject of the Antichrist. 
the Antichrist is going to come after we're gone, and he's going to take over the whole shebang. And that's why the world's looking for a great ruler this morning. The world's wanting a ruler this morning. Do you know? They, they, they say, uh, we ain't had nobody that's no count since Kennedy. And ever since he's come, Johnson, all them, Nixon, and then Carter, and everybody gets in there and they say, we ain't got nobody to lead us to any count. Send us somebody to get us out of the problems and the mess that we're in. And did you know that's just exactly what's going to happen? There is coming a world dictator. And you won't get that from UPI or Associated Press or, or uh, Life and Look and Time magazine. You'll get it from studying the book that stood the test through the ages, God's infallible word. And so there is coming a world dictator that will bring everything under one hand and he'll cause all to worship him and receive a mark in the right hand or on their forehead. And if you're not saved this morning, you better get saved and go with us because we'll miss that stuff. Somebody tells some, sometimes said, you Christians, you just live a boring life. There ain't nothing to do if you're a Christian because you've got to quit partying, you've got to quit drinking, you've got to quit doing everything. Why, well, it's boring being a Christian. Why, you miss a lot of things. I'll tell you what I miss by being a Christian. Going to miss uh, the tribulation. Going to miss the Antichrist. Going to miss the mark of the beast. Going to miss the lake of fire. Going to miss hell. Going to miss all of these things. That's what you miss by being a Christian. I had one of these tracks one time says, what you miss by being a Christian? You open it up and it's just blank pages. And ain't nothing in there. I like that little track. Amen. We was coming through, I was coming through, uh, what town, I believe it was Clarksville last night. It was coming through pretty late. And, brother, there's just people sitting on the sides of the road in their cars. They had nowhere to go in that little town except for the neighborhood theater. And if there's a movie you didn't like, you just went out and sat in your car somewhere. And they were sitting lined up on Main Street, both sides. Funniest looking thing you ever seen. There's cars all the way down on Main Street. Now the store's open, nothing. And there's people sitting in every one of them cars. And I got to looking at them people sitting over there, and boy, they look so happy. They're just sitting over there just staring around. And then they try to tell us it's boring to be a Christian. Yeah. And here I was, brother, go 24 hours a day if I could and still not get half done what I've got to do Amen. and enjoy every minute of it. Yeah. Somebody asked me, how come you don't never take a vacation? Listen, son, I stay on vacation. Yeah. I'm on vacation right now. If I was to get a vacation, you know what I'd want to do? Go preach somewhere or go listen to somebody preach. I'm doing what I enjoy doing. And I'm glad that we, it can be like that. It's not boring being a Christian. You know what you, your problem is? If you think it's boring being a Christian, your problem is you went somewhere and seen a bunch of Christians that look like that. Yeah. Look like they ate a bunch of pickles before they come to church. And they'll just sit there and they'll suck it on a lemon and they'll say, the tears so sweet to trust in Jesus. That's the kind you've been looking at. You've been looking at the wrong kind, friend. There is right now on planet Earth a group of Bible-believing, born-again people with the joy of the Lord in their heart and they're just bright-eyed and bushy-tailed every time you see them. And brother, they're on their way to a better place. That's the kind of people you need to look at. Normally known as fanatics. But they're called Christians in the Bible. And so this morning, we're going to look at a man that's an enemy of God. You don't want nothing to do with this guy. You don't, want nothing, you don't want no trace of it. Look at Revelation 13, verse 1. And I stood, this is John Isle of Patmos, right, and seen the vision, upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast. A beast in the Bible represents a king or a kingdom. It don't always represent a king. It don't always represent a kingdom. You can find that from Daniel 4, about verse 17. A beast represents a king or a kingdom. We, in the case, the beast represents a king. Uh, I believe most of your notes probably got that wrong there. It represents a king. All right, the Bible said a beast rise up out of the sea. Sea in the Bible represents most of the time the mass of human population. And he said, Arise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. We'll find out about them in a little while. And upon his horns, ten crowns. And upon his heads, the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. A leopard, a leopard. And his feet were as the feet of a bear. And his mouth was as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon, that's the devil, gave him his power. All right, the Antichrist gets his power. Straight from who? The devil. And his, and his seat and his and great authority. And we're going to read this right quick. If I stop too much, we're not going to have time to get to what I want to get to. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed. And when this happened, brother, everybody thought he sure must have been sent from God. And all the world wondered after the beast. When he gets, uh, his deadly wound gets healed, everybody says, man, that must be Jesus Christ. 
We better follow him. And the whole world goes and follows this man. And the Bible says that they wandered after the beast and they worshiped the dragon. There's your verse in the Bible for devil worship. The dragon and the devil, they worship the devil, brother, and which gave power unto the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, and who is able to make war with him? And they were given unto him a mouth, speaking great things. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. And power was blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months or three and a half years. And he opened his mouth and blasphemed against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle. And look at this good one for a rapture. And them that dwell in heaven. Wonder who that is dwelling in heaven at that time. Somebody's got to already be up there. That's you and me. And then the Bible said in verse 7, it was given unto him to make war with the saints, the converts of the 144,000, and to overcome them. And power was given unto him. I mean, he killed them, you know, if they didn't deny the Lord. And he killed them because they wouldn't. Power was given unto him. Look at this. World dictator on the scene. He's coming over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him except whose names are not written, written or those that are not written in the book of life slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have ears to hear, have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with a sword must be killed with a sword. Here is the patience and faith of the saints. Here in that tribulation, those saints got to have faith like we got, but they also got to have patience. That after they have had patience, they may inherit the promises, as the book of Hebrews tells us. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns. First of them comes up out of the sea, second of them comes up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb. And he spake as a dragon. And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders. So he maketh fire come down from heaven on the sight in the sight of men. Stop right there just a second. Here's a guy that pulls down fire from heaven. I mean, he can just say, uh, mumbo jumbo, no, 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 you know, something like that. And all of a sudden, just fire is going to come down, and everybody's going to back up and say, that must be the power of God. That must be God. And they're worshiping. But you know what it is? It's the devil. Now, you listen, folks. The devil's got power to work miracles. Yeah. I can stand up here and learn how to pull a rabbit out of a hat. I can stand up here and predict somebody's going to die and might get it right. That don't mean nothing. I mean, just because Gene Dixon, somebody looks into a crystal ball and says somebody's going to die and they die. You know what that means? It means absolutely nothing. It means nothing. The devil can work miracles. And so you find in these days that this man works miracles and everybody says, he must be Jesus. Let's follow him. And brother, they worshiped him. This, and uh, verse 14. Here's his specialty. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles. Miracles can deceive you. That's why you got to watch out for these healing movements in our land today. I'm not saying God can't heal. I know He can. I've asked God to heal me just, just the other day, brother. I was preaching a revival down in Morgan, and I thought I was getting sick. Sure as the world. And I said, Lord, I can't get sick. I've got to go preach tonight. And I was feeling terrible. And I said, I can't be sick. I can't be sick. I've got to go preach tonight. I've got this to do. I've got that to do. I've got to go some more tomorrow. And I just got down and I said, Lord, if you want me to do all these things, you're going to have to help me. And I laid down and took me a little nap, woke up, and felt, felt fine. How felt fine ever since. And I believe God can heal. I believe God can do it. But uh, you've got to watch you know, this stuff about healing and miracles these days because much of it is not from the Lord. And the Bible said in verse 14, He deceived them of those miracles, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast. And that's what a lot of people, Jack Van Eppie and those guys believe, is the computer, you know, the image of the beast that's able to speak and all of those things, that it, uh, which had the wound of sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he, the beast, causeth all, both small and great, to re rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in the right hand or in their forehead, and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. And his number is six hundred, three score, and six. Six hundred, three score, sixty, six, six hundred, sixty-six. That's power heads for prayer. 
Our Father in heaven, we pray now, Lord, that you just for a few minutes this morning, as we look into your word, God, that you'd give us wisdom, help us to have uh, wisdom to rightly divide the word of truth, Lord, to say exactly what you've given us. We ask you, dear Lord, that we'll see the seriousness of this thing, that we'll realize the blessed hope of being saved, and Lord God, that we'll, if there's one here this morning, they'll realize that what this world's headed to, and repent and come to Jesus. Lord, do it by your power, and we'll give you the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Now this morning we're going to talk to you just a few minutes, not hold you long, on the subject of this man. This man who in the Bible, known in 1 John chapter 4, as Antichrist. Now you that, uh, you know it's getting winter time. In just a few months, or just maybe pretty soon, you're going to find out what Antichrist means. How come, preacher? Because anti means opposite or against. Like here is Jesus Christ, and then here is Antichrist. Anti means against or opposite. And the reason I said you're going to find it out in a month or two is because when it gets cold, you don't want your radiator to freeze up, and you don't want your water to freeze, and you go by antifreeze. And it keeps your water and your radiator, if you ain't got a Volkswagen, from freezing. And, brother, you keep that antifreeze, causes that water, it works against the freeze, and it means opposite from freezing. So antichrist is the opposite from Christ. And the Bible tells us there's more scripture on this man in the Bible than I guess there is Elijah or, or Samuel the prophet. I'd be safe to say. There's more scripture given about this one man in the Word of God. We'll be giving them to you in uh, just, uh, just a second. He is opposite and he is a deceiver. I want to show you in just a second how that the Antichrist is opposite from Christ. Now you've got to watch when you just use the word Christ. The word Christ means anointed one. It means anointed. That's all it means. There's many Christ. Did you know that? Somebody said, let Christ come into your heart. Which Christ are you talking about? There's a lot of them. There's any Christ, you know. You better say Jesus Christ. Have you ever noticed how hard it is to say Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ. I mean, it's easy to say, why don't you come to church? It's easy to say, you believe in the Bible. It's easy to say all these things. But have you ever noticed how hard it is just to say them two words, Jesus Christ? It's hard to say. There's something that don't want you to say that because you're acknowledging that you mean the Christ, the Savior of the world, God's only begotten Son. But there is other anointed ones, and Jesus himself said that there would be false Christ come in the last day. And so this is the false of the false, brother. He's big number one himself. We notice that Jesus is called Christ in Matthew 16. He's called the Antichrist in 1 John 4. Jesus is called the Son of God in John 1. He's called the Son of Perdition in 2 Thessalonians 2. Jesus' number is 888, new beginning. The Antichrist number is 666 number of man. Now, Jesus is called the seed of the woman in Genesis 3. The Antichrist is called the seed of the serpent in Genesis 3. Jesus is called the lamb in, John, in Isaiah 53. And he's called, the Antichrist is called the beast in Revelation 11. He's, like, he's opposite. Jesus is called the holy one in Mark 1. The Antichrist is called the wicked one in 2 Thessalonians. Jesus is called the truth in John 14. The Antichrist is called lie in John 8. Jesus is called the Prince of Peace in Isaiah 9. Antichrist is called the Profane Prince in Ezekiel 21. Jesus is called the Good Shepherd in John 10. Antichrist is called the Idle Shepherd in Zechariah 11. Jesus is called the Mighty Angel in Revelation 10. Antichrist is called the Angel of Light in 2 Corinthians 11. And Jesus is called, He came from heaven in John 3. Antichrist comes from the pit in Revelation 11. Jesus came in, his, in, in another's name in John 5. Antichrist will come in His own name in John 5. Jesus has done miracles by the power of the Holy Ghost in Luke 4. The Antichrist does miracles by the power of Satan in Revelation 13. Jesus submits himself to God in John 5. The Antichrist defies God in 2 Thessalonians 2. Jesus Christ humbled himself in Philippians 2. The Antichrist exalts himself in Daniel 11. Jesus cleansed the temple in John 2. And the Antichrist defiled the temple, Matthew 24. Jesus was rejected by the world in Isaiah 53. The Antichrist is accepted by the world in Revelation 13. Jesus goes to heaven in Luke 24. Antichrist goes to hell in Revelation 19. Jesus Christ came to seek and to save in Luke 19. The Antichrist came to doom and damn and destroy in Daniel chapter 8. And so he is the exact opposite of Christ. He come to undo everything Jesus tried to do. He's against God. He's against the Lord. Now you need to learn something. If you're a new Christian, you need to learn this. 
This world is against God. This world don't have no use for God. This world don't have no care about God. They just soon him not even be around. And if you don't believe it, read how they treated the Lord when he showed up back in the New Testament. When the, the, the world's always saying, nobody's perfect. Nobody's perfect. Send us a sinless man. Send us somebody that's sinless. Do you know how they treated the first sinless man that showed up on this earth? They spit in his face. They slapped him. They mocked him. They made fun of him. They put a crown of thorns on his head. They nailed him to the cross and murdered him, brother. That's what the world thinks of God. And you think I'm going to care about what this old world thinks about me? No, sir, brother. No, sir. They're against God. They hate God. They don't care none about you. If you're out, John, and you've got a bunch of friends in the world, you know what your friends are? All they're trying to do is use you. They'll just use you. I remember when I got 16, brother, I had more friends than I knew what to do with. And I got me a car, everybody. Oh, Danny, take me here, take me there. And boy, I was good old Danny all of a sudden until the gas run out or until the money run out and them boys is gone. And brother, one of them, they'll steal your girlfriend if you turn their back, you turn your back. And that's the kind of friends you've got out in this world. This world don't love you. This world ain't nothing but hate and filth and wickedness and sin. That's all they are out there. That's all they are. With friends like that, you don't need no enemies. And brother, you, some of you sitting here this morning, no doubt you've got a bunch of friends out there and you all live it up and go wild together. But little do you know, they're just sponging off of you. They're just using you. And they think they can profit somehow or another by using you. If they didn't, they'd drop you like a hot potato. And that's where the Antichrist is. He's against the Lord. He has no concern for anybody whatsoever. The devil don't even care about you. I've told you before, how that the devil will make you think he's your best friend. He's a deceiver. And there's a lot of people think that the devil get, is their best friend. You know why? Because the devil can give kicks. And the devil can give thrills. He can thrill you to death. You know it? He can make you tingle from your head to your feet. But there's only one thing wrong with his good times. They seem to run out too quick. And you've got to go back and do it again next Friday night. And it seemed like it wasn't so hot. I used to plan out my weekends. Did you ever do that? Just plan them out. Boy, everything's going to go like this, and then we're going to go here, and then we're going to do that, and then all that. And it never did work out like I had it planned. And I kept saying, well, try it again next week. And brother, it never did work out. You know why? There's just a limited amount of pleasure in sin. There's only pleasure in sin for a season. And, and now the devil will tickle you, brother. I mean, you go out here and you, uh, if you smoke pot or you drink or something like that, and you see if you don't tingle all over. But I tell you what, it don't last. There's one thing about drugs. You can go away up. It's like a grasshopper. You can go away up, but you always got to come back down. And when you come back down, your problems are bigger than they were when you went up. And sooner or later, you're going to have to face yourself and face God with this thing. You can't keep running from reality forever. You're going to have to face it sooner or later. And that's where most people mess up today. They think the devil is their friend, which he is not. You say, good night. Look at all them things he give me. You know why he's giving you that, don't you? Send you to hell. I've given the illustration over and over and over. It's like a man with a hog. And he's got a, a hog in his hog lot. And he brings a big bucket of slop down out of that old hog every day. And he brings a big slop bucket full, dump, dumps it in the slop trough, and that old hog just eats the whole thing up. And brother, every day when he sees that man coming down through there with that big bucket of slop, he goes, <clears throat> there's the best friend I've got. He's my best friend on it. Give me that good slop. And just a bucket, a big slop. And he'd stand there and just eat it and eat it and eat it. And he thinks that man, if you could ask that hog and he could talk, he'd say, right there, the best friend I got on this earth. He feeds me every day. Big bucket of slop. And I just love it. But brother, you could just talk to him and talk to him and he'd think I was his best friend. But little does he know that that man is just fattening him up. And when he gets him right where he wants him, he'll come down there with a 22 rifle instead of a bucket of slop. And right between the lines, the old hog goes out. And that's it. He was just fattening him up for the kill. You know that's what devil's trying to do to you? You realize that? He'll give you kicks. He'll give you money. He'll give you a raise. He'll give you all kinds of things to take your mind off of God. And you'll say, boy, the devil's been good to me. He's my best friend. But right when you're not expecting it, you'll have a car wreck or something will happen. And out you'll go into a lake of fire and burn in hell forever and ever and ever because you did not realize the deceiver. The deceiver. Antichrist is a deceiver. Now this man, we want you to notice a couple of things about him. We're going to go. He is a man. Learn that. 
the Antichrist is a man, not a spirit. There are many spirits of Antichrist already in the world. The Bible said in the book of 1 John, and that's where a lot of people get messed up and think that the Antichrist is not really a man, but he's just a spirit. And so in Revelation 13, verse 18, the Bible said it's a number of a man. So it got to be a man, not a system necessarily, not necessar although he'll have a system, not necessarily a, uh, uh, a spirit, but he'll be a man. That's why the new versions of the Bible change verse 18 to the number of man instead of the number of a man. They know the number of man is six. And they change it to that. But anyway, he'll be a man. Notice how the Bible describes this man. I mean, you can pinpoint him with the Word of God, brother, if you'll study it. And I've got, you know, done some study, and, and I've done a lot of hard studying on this other night. About 3 o'clock in the morning, I think it's about Wednesday or Thursday night, and running references and finding things, and I kind of found out this. First of all, he's a man. Revelation 13, 18. He'll be a Syrian Jew. He'll be a Jew by birth and a Syrian by nationality. Daniel 11, 37, Daniel 8, 9. Not only that, he'll be a commercial genius. Revelation 13, 7, 17. He'll be a financial genius. Daniel 11, 43. He'll be an oratorical genius as far as the way he talks. Daniel 11, 21. He'll be a governmental genius. Daniel 7 and 8 and Revelation 13 and 14. And then finally but not least, he'll be a religious genius. As the Word of God says in St. Thessalonians, chapter number 2 and verse 4. He is the greatest genius, the greatest musician, the greatest lover, the greatest architect, the greatest politician, the greatest president, the greatest pope that the world's ever seen, brother. He'll be the greatest one. And when he steps out on the scene, all of a sudden he'll just have power to attract people and they'll say, man, I've never seen anybody like him. And men and women and everybody will just flock to worship this guy and say, boy, he must be Jesus Christ. Do you realize this morning that the Jews don't believe that Jesus was really the Christ and the Jews are still looking for the Messiah to come. Right now, they're still looking for the Messiah to come. And brother, when he comes, this man comes, you know what the whole Jewish nation is going to think. There's the Messiah. He finally showed up. He's finally here. And the people that believe that Jesus Christ is going to come down here, like Jehovah Witnesses, for example, like Catholics, for example, those people that believe that Jesus is going to come down here, they're going to think he's Jesus Christ and say, he's finally come. And the Catholics will say, I told you we have the right religion. And the Jehovah Witnesses will say, he's here to set up the kingdom. And everything will go well for a while. But what they don't know is that they've got a counterfeit. They've got a crook. The real Jesus doesn't come and got what belonged to him and left. And they're left to go through the darkest days this world ever has seen or ever will see. Let me tell you something, folks. You, Jesus said, take heed how you hear. You better watch how you read this Bible. If you don't read it right, it'll mess you up. You better watch, take heed. How, you remember he, he spoke to that man up yonder and he said, How leadest thou? There's different ways of reading the Word of God. You better make sure you got it right. You better make sure. All right, the Word of God said that He has a purpose. His purpose is to deceive the whole world and damn them to worship Him. That's His purpose. Many people don't realize that the devil desires worship, but he does. And then his next purpose, or his next thing about this thing, this uh, man, is that he has a mark. Now, this mark has to do with the numbers three sixes. 600, three score, and six. You that studied numbers in the Bible know that the number six represents man. Six would be man's number. Man was created on the sixth day. And all of these things that represent man falls one short of God's number, which is seven. God's number is seven. And man falls short of that. And 666 is a trinity or a trio of sixes, and that's the very best man can do. This guy I'm talking about this morning is the very best. When is it? And then tonight, Lord willing, we're going to take uh, where is the Antichrist and then finally who is the Antichrist in tonight's service. So tonight, this morning, we're going to look at this question, when is the Antichrist? When is it going to be? When is he going to show up? I mean, is it going to be this year? All right. Let's think just for a minute. Now, you and I as premillennial people, if we got our Bible right, believe that he, go, he comes in after you and I are gone. 
Take your Bible, turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And we'll look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 in just a moment. And I want to give you a few verses of Scripture about uh, where this comes from, uh, this business about the rapture you hear so much about. You've heard about people disappearing, everybody wondering where they're at and all that stuff. And you say, well, where in the world did that come from in the Bible? Th uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2 and verse uh, number 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse number 3. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, and this day talking about the day of Christ as up above there in verse 2, that millennial day, the new kingdom, the Lord come, you know, the reign of the kingdom, shall not come except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin, that's the Antichrist, be revealed the son of perdition. All right, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worship. Everybody looking at that? It said he opposeth and exalteth himself above God. And he made everybody worship him. And he said, remember, I told you about this stuff. And then verse 6 says, you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. Paul says here in this verse, he says, you know what's stopping him from being revealed right now. What's, what's stopping the Antichrist from taking over the world right now? There's only one thing that's stopping him. Verse number 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth. The word letteth means hinder. How do you know? Isaiah 43, 13. Romans 1, 13. And I had another note down somewhere. I believe it's uh, over in the book of uh, Genesis. Yeah, I believe in the book of Genesis. Isaiah 43, 13. Romans 1, 13 describes or defines the word let. The word let, Old English, means hinder. He said there's one thing that hinders the Antichrist from being revealed right now. There ain't but one thing hinders it. And you know what he said it, uh, that it was? He said only he. It's a person. He's a person that's stopping the Antichrist from being revealed right now. He who now letteth or hindereth will let or hinder until he be taken out of the way. All right, who is the one person in this world that's hindering the devil from taking over the whole shebang? Is it Billy Graham? Is it uh, Oral Roberts? Is it uh, uh, Rex Humbard? James Robinson? Those guys, brother, what prevented the devil from taking over before they got here? There's one person in this world that's stopping the devil from taking over right now. He, Jesus said, when he's come, he'll reprove the world. He's a restrainer. It's the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Ghost of God. And he is the only thing in this world that has the power to stop the devil from taking over the whole mess right now. The only reason me and you still have the spirit and liberty to preach and to, to, to go out and the reason people at least wear a little bit of clothes and the only the reason that people at least have a little bit of respect left is because the Holy Spirit of God is still here convicting them and make them feel bad. But you know what the Bible said? He's going to stop it. And verse 7 said, until he be taken out of the way. God's going to reach down, just move his spirit out of the way. And when he moves his spirit out of the way, as the old saying goes, all hell's going to break loose. You don't want to be around when that happens. How do you know we're going to be gone, brother? Because you do realize the Holy Spirit lives in our heart, don't you? If he's a living in my heart, i got a promise from him. I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. God ain't going to jerk him out of there and leave us down here. If he's in your heart, son, when he goes, you'll go. Amen? Amen? Yeah. And brother, because the Lord promised he'd never leave us nor forsake us, if he goes, we got to go with him. Amen. That means any split second while we're sitting here in this church, you might look around here and all of a sudden, about 80% of the people in this, in this building disappear. Nothing be left out but an old pile of clothes and false teeth and glasses and ring and watches and that stuff like that. And you'll go, where did everybody go? Where did everybody go? And you know what you'll do? Jump up and scream your and pull your hair out and come to this altar and beg and beg and scream, Oh God! Oh God! I want to get saved! I want to get saved! But you know what the Bible said? Too late! Too late! You had your chance and blew it. Amen. said, I ain't never heard no tell or no preaching like that. I guess that's why I'm a preaching it needs to be told. Amen. The world's going to get ripped off, brother. And when this guy comes, he'll be Mr. Satan himself. Just like Jesus was God in the flesh, the Antichrist is the devil in the flesh. I mean, I mean I've met some people that I felt like was messing around living close to the devil. I've met some people, brother, that I, I could almost say I believe they're possessed. 
Really? I remember people, we talked to people, I remember this guy we talked to, Nashville, Nashville, Tennessee. Good place to get to Zed. He, uh, he was on the street, and man, you wouldn't believe that guy. And there was one weirdo walking down the street, brother. Brother Lewis members. Uh, you were, no, he wasn't with us. Uh, I don't know who all was with us. Brother Rick was, I believe. Chris. He was a guy, yeah, Brother Chris. We was walking down the street, and he was just walking down through there, you know. And he had a hat on. I'm thinking about a different one. He had a big hat on. And he had his pants down in, you know, down inside of his big boots were tough, you know. And he uh, had his pants down in there, and he was walking around there. And he was just walking like this. He real long, skinny, and tall. And I seen that thing walking down. What in the world is that? And I said, boy, that guy's weird. And I thought, no, that's a woman. That is a woman. It really is. You can't tell these days, you know. Used to, when they turned around and faced you, you could tell a difference. You can't even tell that way nowadays. I mean, they're able to fix you up, brother, and you get some messed up, you don't know what you are. I heard a guy out in California sue the doctor. He was going to have a, you know, one of them, uh, they make him a transvestite, change him into a woman, and he was going to have an operation. He sued the doctor because he didn't turn into what he was trying to turn into. And they have homosexual churches and gay preachers and all that junk. Everybody just comes in there and will say, we're gay and we're proud and God's really in our church. I tell you what, there's a spirit there, but it ain't God's spirit. His ain't a million miles of that place unless it's convicted. And when you marry somebody in one of those churches, you've got to say, do you, whatever you are, take this, whatever it is, to be whatever you're trying to be? That's right. And two men kiss each other and go out in the car and drive off and live happily ever after. Crazy age we're living in. You know what? This world's gone nuts, man. Amen. They're gone crazy. They're gone crazy. They're crazy. They don't know where they're coming or going. Amen. I, I wouldn't trust them if I was you. Amen. And brother, when this, when this time comes, these people be messed up like, like this guy. I need to tell you about him. Come to find out it was a man, I think. Do you know what he's doing? I seen him walk up to this black guy drunk, couldn't stand up, kiss him right in the mouth. A white boy. But nothing's wrong these days. Sin's out, out of style. There ain't no such thing as sin. If that would have happened 40 years ago, they'd have locked him up. Yeah. Right. Amen, brother. Somebody said, no, you're prejudiced. Oh, I'll prejudice your foot. But i got a stomach and some things make me want to pew. That's just modern new morality. The new morality ain't nothing but the old immorality. And it's getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse and worse and when this man steps out on the scene you know this crazy bunch ain't going to be able to tell who he is they come out in New York City several years ago with a little bottle of new perfume and oh they give it such publicity and all the ladies just the high society tea drinking limousine you know they went crazy over it oh have you tried the latest oh have you tried the latest they give it a big fancy name like Evening and Spruce Pine and the brother they had a, a fancy name on that little bottle and it had just a little two ounce three or four ounce bottle and sold it for eleven dollars $11 just for uh, a little bit of uh, uh, perfume that they couldn't figure out what it was. And I said, oh, the fragrance. Oh, the fragrance. It's just so natural. Natural. I don't see much sense in using them that don't smell like nothing. Well, you can just not use nothing to smell like that. They use unscented, you know. And he said, oh, this is so wonderful. Now, oh, they went and bought it and everything. And they got to do a little investigating on that thing, come to find out that it wasn't a thing in the world but pure, clear, undiluted water. That's all it was. Just pure water. And they were selling it for $11 for a little bitty bottle full. And it was oh, it just went, oh, it, and I, can you imagine how they felt when they found that? Now, if society can take something and put it in a magazine on a newspaper and fool the population over something like that. How easy do you think it's going to be for the devil to come out here and he says, I have decided that now we have a new program, folks, and I'm going to stop war, and I'm going to stop this. And everybody say, there's the man we've been looking for. And the Bible said when he comes, they'll eat him up. They'll go wild over him. I stopped at a truck stop this morning. I got slit. I, I made up my mind I was going to drive till I got too sleepy, and then I'd stop and get some meat. So I stopped at a truck stop just this side of Winston Salem. I reckon it's about uh, two thirty, two well, two o'clock, something like that. Almost two o'clock. 
And I went in there, you know, and boy, I dreaded it before I even walked in. Truck stopped two o'clock in the morning, you know. I went in there and there they was. Same old thing the rest of the truck stops got. First thing I heard, boom, 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 I went to the library, and up at the library, I found some uh, some uh, uh, albums of uh, jungle dances of the tribe of Uwamba and stuff like that. And I said, I'm going to put one of these things on that record player and just listen to it. And it said the old tribal dances of the tribes on doing deep, dark Africa and all that stuff. And brother, I, I went over and put it on ready, uh, the record player and put them little headphones on and put that thing on, and they start off. Just like that. Just like that, oh no, 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 like that, and it's a hell, 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 all that stuff, you know. And it didn't have sound half as bad as the stuff you people, some of you listen to every day. That's right out of the jungle, brother. Heathen, you talk about heathen. There's more heathen right here in the United States probably than there are some of them old heathen countries. Burning up babies and killing them, and wow, brother, crazy people. Bunch of heathens. And I didn't know where I was listening to the top ten or something that really did come from Africa. The only thing they didn't have was a bass guitar and a fuzz lead guitar. That's the only thing they didn't have. They had the drum, they had the beat, had them little sticks. They go like that with them. Sound just like it. But anyway, I went into this truck stop and I went in there late this morning. And I was thinking, I was trying to meditate, you know, on the, on the subject of the Antichrist, what I was going to preach on this morning. And I went in there and sat down, and I was kind of going in and out, a little bit sleepy. And I, this girl come up and waited on me, and I, I'd uh, told her I wanted, you know, a sandwich and a drink to go. I had to get out of there. I told her I had to leave. And uh, there's, I looked around me, and here's what I saw. About that time, there's this guy come around and said, I want to sit over here in the corner. And he sat down right beside me. And I said, sir, are you going to church this morning? He said, well, I go to church every Sunday. And I said, uh, are, are you a Christian, sir? And he said, well, now, I don't always do everything I should. And I said, uh, uh, what do you mean? Are you, well, you either are or you ain't. You're a Christian by knowing Jesus Christ. And he said, uh, I don't, I don't, he said, I have trouble. He said, he, he looked like he's 60 years old. He said, well, I see a pretty woman. Oh, man, what are you worried about? <laughs> 60 years old. And he said, he said, when I see a pretty woman, I know right then what his problem was. Yeah. Yeah. And he said, let me ask you. And I said, before you ask me, God said it was wrong. God said it was wrong. It's adultery. It's fornication. It's a bunch of filth. Sir, if you ain't mad, forget it. What I told him. I said, God will judge you one day if you break his word and his law. Amen. And he said, well, I, I, I. I said, there ain't no well, no, no buts to it. That's what God said. I'm too sleepy to mess with him, run around, talk around him for a half hour. And I just told him to, that that's what God said. He knew what God said, but he's trying to get out of it. So I looked at him. Then I looked at that girl waiting. I asked her if she going to church this morning. She said, do you think I'm going to go to church this morning? I can't even get home change clothes. And then I looked over here, and there's a guy sitting around here with big cowboy hats on. A whole table full of them. Real big ones. Sitting all around this table. And then I looked over there, and there's two young boys and two young girls. And they look plum pitiful. Well, I just, had a, uh, I just walked by them in. I give, a, give one of them a track. I talked over and told the others that Jesus loved them. Sitting in that 2 o'clock in the morning. Looked like he's 15, 16 years old. And a girl sitting there with a big knife on the side of her. Looked like a big old scab on her neck about that big around. Amen. And I got to looking at that crowd. And I thought, what in the world is these people doing? What are they living for? All they're going to do is stay out here all night. They're going to go home, sleep all day Sunday. They'll get up Monday morning, work next, get their money, buy them some, something, you know, go do it again next week. And I said, these people, they're bound. When the Antichrist comes, they're bound to say, hey, praise the Lord. Oh, no, no. They're bound to say something. They're bound to say, he's here, he's here, he's here, he's here. Now we're going to really have fun. We're going to live it up. And they'll be, they'll be deceived by him. All right, the mystery of iniquity. Soon as we're gone, I don't know how soon it'll be, but after we're gone, he'll step out. And immediately everybody will fall in love with him. He's the people's choice by popular vote. Just like Saul was. We're going to give you the types of him in the Old Testament and New Testament tonight. 
But he's like Saul, brother. They cried, give us a king! Give us a king! Give us a king! We want somebody to lead us! We want somebody to lead us! And the Lord said, well, just, you just wait a while. I've got one over here. He was saving David for that purpose. And they said, no, give us a king! Give us a king! And the Lord said, all right, here you are. And he gave him Saul. You know how Saul turned out. But you know when people cry out and cry out and cry out for something, God will give them their request, but send leanness to their soul, brother. And I want you to know, brother, they're out there crying out in the world this, this morning, give us a leader, give us a leader. Nixon messed up. Johnson messed up. Carter ain't no camp. We can't get nobody to help us. Everybody's a crook. Help us, help us, help us. And God's going to let them have a leader. But it'll be the wrong leader. Now, the reason, one other thing I'll mention about the church being gone, the word church is mentioned about 20 times in Revelation 1 to 3. After Revelation 4, verse 1, it ain't mentioned no more. Gone. All right, we'll go on to this. God returns when the church is gone. God goes back to dealing with Israel as a nation, the Jewish nation. Listen, have you ever thought about this? If the church was still here, every time a Jew got saved, he'd be a part of the church. And that would make him a part of the body of Christ. And therefore, God couldn't go back to dealing with Israel as a nation. The body of Christ would still be the main thing. So the church got to be moved out of the way, take somewhere, so that God can go back to the Jewish nation again and deal with them. Now, we'll get out of this rough stuff just a minute and give you some more uh, things about the coming of this man. All right, let's look at some signs. And then I'll close. Do you realize this morning that we're seeing signs of this thing shaping up right now? I mean, brother, there's things going on right now that the world would have never believed 50 or 60 years ago. You know the knowledge explosion that we've had? They tell us that 90% of the scientists who ever lived are alive today. That over 70% of the medicines that they use right now have been developed since World War II. They tell us that over that knowledge is doubling every two and a half years. Encyclopedia Britannica has to print a brand new volume every single year to get new accumulated knowledge. Daniel said that in the time of the end, knowledge shall increase. Nobody ever could understand the book of Daniel until just the past few years. There was never a commentary written on the book of Daniel that made any sense until the 20th century, brother. He said these words are sealed up to the time of the end, Daniel. And now, brother, there's people understanding the book of Daniel and it's all fitting in together and it's all making sense. And, brother, that means Jesus is coming. We might leave out of here today. If you ain't ready, you better get ready. You say, well, I don't believe. That's exactly how come you get left behind, too. Unbelievers get left. Only believers go up to be with the Lord. Amen. Brother, I want you to know the signs are here. Listen to these signs. There was no land on earth called the land of Israel for hundreds and hundreds of years until 1948. 1948, the flag went back up and Israel went back to their homeland. They have to be back for studied this and I've studied it but I didn't pay no attention in high school. You probably studied it and how that Israel became a nation again in 1948. Now, they're considering peace. Israel is for the first time in 2,500 years. The first time in 2,500 years the nation of Israel is thinking about signing peace. You say, what is that so big deal? What does that mean? Listen, well, the first thing the Antichrist does when he comes is sign the contract with Israel, brother. For peace, that's the first thing he does. He makes a pact with them for one week or seven years. And in the midst of that week, three and a half years, he breaks that covenant and that's when the mark comes in and all of that stuff. So Israel right now is wanting to sign some peace treaties. Yeah. Getting close. Yeah. There's already things happening now that I'm getting to get a little bit worried. That's supposed to happen after we're gone. Have you ever thought the Lord come back and you got left? That's a spooky feeling. I know I'm saved. I know I am. But still, when we was in Atlanta, and I was kind of in a day, you know, all that stuff down there, boy, we went to underground at 2 o'clock in the morning, Friday, 2 o'clock on Saturday morning. Boy, you talk about a bottomless pit. Smoke boiling up out of there. Look, just like coming up out of hell. And we was down there walking around that day and we was giving out tracks. And some of the weirdest looking people you've ever seen in your life. Characters. They come out at night like that. Never see them. They just come out at night. And we, we was walking down through there giving out tracks. And I believe it was Jean who was supposed to be my partner. We always take off with a partner and the next thing we know I don't even know where none of them's at. 
And I believe Gene was supposed to be my partner that day. And we was walking down this busy street just, here you are, here you are, here you are, just giving out track right and left. And we was talking to people and everything, and uh, I got over here or something, and I looked over here, and I looked around, and Gene was gone. Where in the where in the world is he at? I, look, I said he couldn't have got away. He was right here just a second ago. I said where did he? And I looked in the store. I looked up yonder, and I couldn't see Jenny. And then all of a sudden, something said, "The Lord come, you got left behind." I said, "No, no, I know him." I said, reckon it really did. And but you know what? Come to find out, he was there was a big pole that I held up, you know, in the store, and he was right behind that pole talking to a guy. And I know good and well I'm saved, and that kind of you know, jarred me a little bit. Have you ever thought about the Lord coming back and your husband be gone, your wife be gone, your baby be gone, you be left behind? Your mother and daddy go there, Mama, I heard something terrible on the news. What's happened, Mama? What's happened, Mama? And Mama and Daddy ain't home. And Mama's got a pot of soup just boiling over on the stove. And Daddy Glonmore's are running out in the front yard just sitting there. You say, Mama, Mama, Daddy, and you call, and you, and you look, and you look, and you look, and you go down, and maybe she thought, maybe the preacher's, maybe they went down to the preacher's house, and you went down, and the preacher ain't there. And his door is standing wide open. It'd be scary, wouldn't it? Jesus said, I come like a thief in the night when the world's not looking for him. And it don't take somebody with very much sense to realize this world this morning ain't looking for him. They ain't looking for the Lord. Let me give you these signs, and I'll close. All right. There are computers in the world this morning with a 4,000-word vocabulary. They can talk to you just like... I, I don't know if I know 4,000 words. I don't know how many I know, but I, I don't know. They can talk to you intelligently. I answer any questions. They had one on the Phil Donahue show not too long ago. I heard Brother Jack Van Ippie was telling about it. And they can feed questions in that thing that answer any question you ask it. Set up, how to know, how to math, how to eye. And he said it talked a little, you know, a little slow, but, you know, the thing could talk. What does that mean, preacher? Do you realize how much information one of these computers can store up? They, they got one, the main head mother computer, is in Brussels, Belgium. And that thing covers about a three blocks of the city there. Brussels, Belgium just happens to be the home of the common market. And they tell me that just there was only nine nations in the common market. We're looking for ten. People believe the Bible looking for ten. Because that, that, that king, when he has it, comes ten kingdoms that operate under him. We believe that's what the devil will use. And did you know they are hoping Norway or somebody, who was it, would join not too long ago? And they raised, went ahead and raised that tenth flag up there. There's already ten flags are flying. Although they're, they're mad, they have the tenth one by now. I don't know listen to the news much or anything. But they said they went ahead and raised that tenth one just to represent the tenth one that would soon be coming. And for years, Bible preachers and believers have been watching for them to get ten. Yeah. I'm not saying that's exactly the way it happened, but they've always been watching for it. And over in Belgium, this computer, they say that that thing's got enough sense to give every person on planet Earth a number. You know what the name of it is? The beast. It's the name of the computer. They, how come they, they don't know nothing about the Bible? Why'd they name it that? Because this old sinful world that's hated God all these years, God just uses them to fulfill His Word. You can't beat God, you better join Him. You better get on His side. They have a capability of storing up 10 trillion people in some of those things. Jack Benipe said they could assimilate all the thousands of words in the Bible five times. Or, or, or several times, and, and, or a thousand times, I think, in five seconds. All the words in the Bible. Get them all, just like that. This would give the Antichrist all the information he wanted on anybody, right at his fingertips. Punch a button, he can find out what you're doing, man, in North Carolina. Where you're at, what your, what your number is, everything, all about you. Let me give you this. Did you know that you can get in modern magazine on the news that they're hollering out to do away with our dollar? There's a big drive on in the United States and other parts of the world to do away with them. I've done, done away with mine. But they, they are trying to do away with the American dollar. Just move it right off of the scene. Just get it right out of the way where people will not be able to use it. And they're trying to bring in another currency. Another type of currency for the world to use. And you, you've probably heard all this talk about it. The checkless, cashless society is at hand, folks. It's just around the corner. Leaders are talking about it all over the place that the first thing you know, you won't use no checks. It costs several billion dollars a year for the United States banks 
to just to process checks and printing. All this is just a waste of money. They'll do away with them to save. And all the checks will be gone. All the cash will be gone. And my dear friend, the leaders are crying, away with cash. Why? Because it'll eliminate crime. It'll stop drug traffic. It'll do all of those things if you could just get rid of the cash. Cash is what people kill each other for. <laughs> that's why that everything's, that's why all the stores got computer things in them now. And that's why you see these weird looking little lines on all the food you buy. You seen them? Everything you buy has got them little lines on it now. You know what that is? I don't even know if they started using it yet, have I? I mean, some places aren't they run that little thing up. Boy, yeah, that place down there in Morgan. I went down out of that place. We was checking out Food World. I don't know. I think they changed it, didn't they? They used to have it anyway. And brother, they'd, they'd pick up that thing, have a bunch of little lines on that thing, run that little pit like they total up how much that thing was on that cash register. And I seen that, I said, whoa. They better not get that thing around my hand. Around my head. I don't want to mess with it. And you know what that means? The world is getting to a place to where they don't use no cash. There are some leaders that predict by 1982, and in two or three more months it's going to be 1980, that cash will be a thing of the past. We'll operate on a brand new system. Now that's their, I didn't predict that. They did. All right? As soon as you go up, all the computers in the world will be able to hook to this one big master computer in Belgium. That means the man in Belgium, or wherever he's at, can get the information on any person in this world he wants, where he spends all his money, where it all goes to. Every bit of it. Now, they say that it'll be like this. Daniel said, in the days of these kings, Shall the Lord God set up a kingdom? That lets you know. He said these ten kings, in the days of these kings, the Lord shall set up a kingdom. That's the millennium. And my dear friend, by 1985, I'm just saying maybe, according to uh, Dr. Jack Van Eden, by 1985, you'll push your buggy through a, sur a supermarket and you'll put all your stuff in there that you want. And when you push up to the cash register, the lady will say, have your number, please. And maybe, just maybe, they'll start out with a little card, like a credit card. And this credit card or card will have just your number on it, and your number will be different from anybody else's. And when they punch that button of your number on that computer, that retail, uh, uh, tallies down yonder at the bank where you've got your bank account, and immediately they get back to answer whether or not you've got enough money in the bank to cover what you're trying to buy. You don't carry no cash on you. When he comes up and he does this thing, don't you realize how the world's going to eat that up? How many old men and old women do you know right now that's afraid to walk down the street because they're afraid somebody will mug them and steal their money? See? When you get rid of that money, they'll say, He solved the crime! He stopped the drug pushers! The drug pushers out here behind the bushes, you know, give me 20, 20, you know, sell that stuff, you know. When you don't have no cash, you can't do that. Yeah. And they'll say, He has the answer! He stopped all the crime! He stopped the drug traffic! Traffic. He's the greatest thing this world's ever seen. And then somebody will say, But why don't they... Wonder what if somebody stole your card? Couldn't they steal your card? And run off over here and buy them something before anybody found out it wasn't really their card? And they say, Yeah, that's right. That could happen, couldn't it? And they're already talking about the only way you can't get it stolen is have it tattooed on your, on your body. On the hand or on the forehead. No doubt, it'll be invisible. You won't be able to see it. And you'll never know a person's got it until they go up to the checkout land to buy something and they'll run that thing over there. Sir, you ain't got no number. The Bible says that they can't buy or sell unless they have the mark. You say, that sounds a little far-fetched. I don't know if it does or not, friend. I don't know if it does or not. I'd watch it for you. You know, when you first meet a person, the first time you ever meet them, it's, uh, you, just, you just barely know them. After you get to know them a little bit better, then, you know, you can say, well, I know him pretty good. And then after you've maybe been around him for years and years, you say, well, I'm well acquainted with him. And that's the way it is kind of with the Lord. When you first meet the Lord, you just meet him. But then as you learn about him, you get more and more and more acquainted with him, and then maybe you'll be able to say, I'm well acquainted with him. I hope that you will. There's some people that I meet in this world that when I first meet them, they make a good impression on me. After I know them a little while, I'm disappointed. 
There's other people in this world that I'm, that when I first meet them, I mean, they don't do too much for me. And after the longer I know them, the better I like them, the more confidence I have in them. And that's, that's the kind of person I want to be. I want to be a person that, you know, the longer people know me, the more have confidence they have in me instead of the less. Uh, but Jesus, you know, the longer you know him, the more confidence you have in him, the more faith you have in him. And that's why it's, it's so good to be able to study the Word of God together. Let's all bow our heads for a word of prayer. <laughs> every head bowed and every eye closed, let's ask God to speak to our hearts through his Word, by his Spirit, as only he can do. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for help and strength and the blessings of life. Thank you, Lord, that we're saved, saved, saved. Oh, God, we realize tonight, Lord, that we're an abomination in your sight and the flesh. And God, we ask you to forgive us of our sins. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Every idle word, every thought, every intention, every deed, every action, lust, envy, jealousy, hatred, backbiting, haters of God, blasphemers, anything about us, Lord, that's wrong, God, we pray in Jesus' name right now, you would cleanse us by the blood of the Lamb. And I'm asking you, Father, in Jesus' name, you would fight off the powers of the demons of hell, and we plead the blood of Jesus over this service tonight. Lord, we just want exactly what you want done in this place tonight. God, we know, Lord, that no fountain should send forth sweet and bitter water, but, Lord, we pray, God, that we'll be a fountain of life, God, that may send forth the sweet waters of Jesus. Dear God in heaven, I pray right now, Lord, that you'd illuminate our mind, loose our tongue, that we may declare thy word without fear, without favor, without compromise, Lord, that we may not be ashamed of it, Lord. Lord, that we'll stand true and bold in the name of Jesus. I ask you, Father, that you drive out every hindering power of spirit. Do with us and for us and through us tonight what needs to be done in this service. And Lord Jesus, whatever's accomplished, God, we'll bow our heads and thank you and praise you and give you all the honor and the glory for it all. For it is in the name of our blessed Lord we pray, and for his sake, amen. Now in the book of Revelation, chapter 13, open your Bibles there, we'll... I uh, read there verse or two this morning. We'll not read it all again tonight. For uh, the sake of going on into this and sake of time, I want you to turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 13. And we studied about this morning, and this first time we've ever done this since our church has, has been going. And we felt like we should do it, take a Sunday and do this. A study on the, uh, uh, the message centered on what the Bible calls, what we know as the Antichrist. And we know that he is a coming world dictator that's going to come over and take over this world. And the whole world shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life. You know, the world tonight is crying out for a leader. Everywhere you go, they say, well, uh, uh, Johnson blew it, Nixon blew it, now Carter ain't no camp. And they're saying this, this is what, you know, most people are saying. And they're saying, we need us a president to get in there and straighten this mess out. We need us a ruler that'll come over and straighten out, solve all these war problems and solve all these things and little children going hungry and the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer and stop communism and we need us a leader and the world tonight is right, they're right for a leader. They're crying out. Nobody has any confidence. You know when the Watergate scandals, all those things came out, you know what the purpose the devil had behind that? The devil's purpose behind those things was to destroy the confidence of the people in the leaders. Because after he got the people's confidence destroyed in their leaders, they'd be looking somewhere else for a leader. And brother, one of these days, he's going to step out. And brother, the Bible calls him, just like we would call Jesus God in the flesh, the Bible calls him the devil in the flesh. <clears throat> and if you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, I wouldn't walk out that door unless I knew that I say it. Because you'll be left behind, behind to worship that guy if you don't receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. A lot of people got a lot of different ideas about what a Christian is. I talked to a man that uh, run the motel where I've been staying this past week, and I talked to him and I said, Sir, are you a Christian? Are you a child of God? And he said, Well, I'm doing the best I can. I'm, I'm getting old now, and I don't really do much all that bad. And I tried to explain to him, that being a Christian is not determined, folks, by what a person does or what they don't do. You see, you can quit all of these things in the world. I mean, you can straighten up your life, you can turn over a new leaf, and you can quit doing everything. 
I mean, you can go up to the top of the mountain somewhere and not, uh, not drink and not cuss, not smoke or chew or throw with them that do and still be lost and still be on your road to hell. Being a Christian tonight is not something you do or something you don't do. Being a Christian is not do's and don'ts and in things. Being a Christian is in a person. And that person is the Lord Jesus Christ. And by faith in Him, we have uh, access to the very throne of God. And we told you this morning, to make uh, cut this introduction short, how the, the Antichrist has been... So, uh, uh, what's, the, what's the word I'm trying to think of? He's being uh, preceded in the days that we're living in by all kinds of signs and things that are pointing to his coming. The similarities and the uh, unusual occurrences of the number 666 shows us that the world is getting used to numbers. Right. You know the world operates already just about right now on numbers? Yeah. I mean, you've got a social security number, you've got a bank number, you've got a driver's license number, you've got this number, and you've got that number, and just, you've got a telephone number, and the whole world just about right now is being governed by numbers. But it's all going to come into one head and one big world religion and one big fancy church and he'll be the head over it and he'll say it's time for us to bring all of our currency into one system. And we'll do away with these old dollar bills so people won't get mugged and beat up on the street and everything. And we'll bring in a Bank of America card type thing that has a number. It'll be 666, whatever your number might be. 666-4, whatever your number might be. And then you'll be able to go to the grocery store. As I told you this morning, this way, now I and I'm not saying that everything I'm saying right now has got to happen just like this. I'm saying this is the way it could be. When you go to the grocery store about 1985 and try to ramrod all this stuff through, and I have no idea that they will or won't. I know they're trying to. Then you go into a grocery store, you put your stuff in your buggy, you run that stuff all of them. You know, it's, it's rough going to them places now. I read where women can push a, a buggy through a, a, depart, a, a food store nowadays at the rate of $55 an hour. And brother, that you can push these things through uh, these things, and when you get everything that you want and, and piled up in your buggy, you come to the checkout counter. And when you come to the checkout counter, she says, number please, and you pop out the little number and give it to her, and she runs that little thing over it, and it rings a number down at the bank, and checks out immediately whether or not you have enough cash in the bank to pay for your groceries. And if you do, then you get your grocery, don't you? might have to put some of them back. And you might uh, just cover it like that. You handle no cash, you handle no check. Don't you see what that would do to the drug traffic? It would just about eliminate it. People out here behind the bushes selling dope, you know, they, they couldn't handle no cash. And brother, they could, it could be stopped. Because somebody would rail in down at the bank, you know, they wouldn't have no computer to run it in down there. And they say that would stop the drug traffic. It would stop prostitution. It would stop all the, the things in the, the world that, that the world thinks is giving us the trouble. No longer would people be scared to death of getting mud. And you see, when this guy comes and he sets up all of this stuff, they're going to say, man, that's the greatest guy that's ever been on the face of this earth. He got, he solved the, dr the drug problem that started in the late 60s in the United States. He solved it and he done away with it. And so tonight, he'll win their affection by flattery. The Bible said he'll come in peaceable and obtain the kingdom by flattery. He'll just come in and flatter you. That's why you got to always watch for a person that's always flattering you. Did you hear that? You've got to watch out, brother, for a person that's always a bragging on you. Yeah. Somebody come up to me and just pat me on the back and down I'm kind of suspicious of them. I kind of think, what are they up to? They're trying to get something off of me. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, just us brothers and sisters. We do that all the time. But I'm talking about, you know, some stranger come along and he's ready to flatter you and give you a dump a bunch of gifts on you. And when you don't even know him, you better watch that guy, brother. He's up to something. And the same thing is... Um, in a preacher. If a preacher just flatters, 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 tells everybody how nice they are all the time, and don't tell them there's a hell, don't tell them there's a place to go where people burn when they die. Why? I, I, he's a crook. Well, you say, well, well, I know a preacher that don't never preach on hell. I don't know if I'd leave my billfold laying around where he is at. So I don't, I think he's a good man. Let me ask you something, friend. What if your little girl or your little boy was on your porch? And they was walking across that porch barefooted, and I was sitting over here on the side of the porch, 
and right over here on the corner of that porch was a big six foot long diamond back rattlesnake. And he was just wild up by a pile dust, and he saw that little kid coming to him, that little kid just playing, you know, barefooted, running over towards him in bare feet, and about that time that snake's head jerks back like that, and then rattles jump up and jerks just like that, and that little kid starts to step on that snake. What kind of a friend would I be to you if I just said, well, now, now I don't want to force them into anything. I don't want to judge them. They don't want nobody telling them what they should do. So I'll just let her go ahead and make her own decision. You say, you'd be a sorry, low-down individual to let my kids step on a rattlesnake and not even try to stop it. Amen. You got the picture? I sure would. But I want you to know how much sorrier would I be if I got up here behind this sacred desk and opened this sacred book and refused to tell people that they was dropping off into hell. And when you see it happening, when you see it, I mean, if you don't want them, you don't love them. There's something wrong with you. If a person don't warn people about hell, they do the one or two things wrong with him. He either don't believe in hell or he just don't care whether people go there or not. Amen. One of those two things is wrong with them. Amen. Most people these days don't believe in hell. But anyway, any Christ, when he comes, he'll come in by flattery. He'll come in peaceably. And he'll change, uh, receive the kingdom by flattery. And everybody say, oh, isn't he wonderful? Oh, isn't he handsome? Oh, isn't he uh, is he a genius? Oh, he solved all of our problems. And the whole world will wonder. The Bible says, after the beast. You see in Revelation 13 and verse 1, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast. I told you this morning that a beast represents in the Bible a king or a kingdom. Sometimes it represents just a king, sometimes it represents just a kingdom. Most of the time it represents a king first and then his kingdom. And then it says, I saw it rise up out of the sea. Sometimes in the Bible that sea represents masses of human people, and sometimes in the Bible it just saw him just like coming up out of a little sea, out of underneath the sea somewhere, as which maybe this one was. For you see over in Revelation chapter 9, or uh, I believe it is, uh, chapter number 9 and verse 11. You see chapter number 9, Revelation chapter 9 and verse 11. The Bible says, And they, these scorpions that came out in verse 10, they had a king over them. Now there's your king, not there. And brother, his, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name is in the Hebrew tongue, Abaddon, and in the Greek tongue has his name Apollyon, destroyer. And the same uh, uh, word there is used for this king that is over the bottomless pit. So this king that we're talking about tonight reigns over the bottomless pit. He don't say he came out right. He just said these locusts that came out had a king, see. And brother, he's over this place. And he's over a place called the bottomless pit. I mean, he's king over it. Now, the reason I don't do too much preaching like this is because I like to keep things simple and plain and easy where people understand it. And so if you're just visiting with us tonight, and come back another time. We'll get on some of the rest of the stuff. But I want you to notice tonight something about this uh, king. We notice, as I read to you this morning, I'll re briefly review that, how that we see the number 666 popping up all over the world. And the Bible said his number is 600, three score, and six. Six, six, six. Or what you might heard of as the mark of the beast. We don't know exactly how that mark will be applied. Chances are it may be just tattooed or something on the far on the hand or on the forehead. That I means some of these good citizens, you know, that say, "Boy, I want to be a good citizen for my country." Put it right there on me. Some of them will probably do like that. And then others who want to just come out on to us, uh, you know, maybe want to be a little bit different, will have it put on their hand. I imagine a person gets your choice. It may give a person a little bit more privilege by having it on their head than on their hand. I don't know. The Bible don't say. It. But it does say they'll either have it on their hand or they'll have it on their forehead. And if they don't, they can't buy nothing and they can't sell nothing. And Revelation chapter 13 and verse 18. You say, well, Brother Danny, I've always been brought up to believe. There's your problem right there. That's exactly what's the matter with you. Now, it's all right to believe what mom and daddy believe, just as long as what mom and daddy believes is the Bible. Amen? But when they start this stuff about every trouble set on its own bottom, 
And, you know, you can't tell winner from summer in the last day. Just throw what mom and daddy says out the window, brother. And grandma and everybody else. Amen? I mean, preachers, anybody. The Bible is to be taken literally. For you that don't know, the Bible don't say nothing about every tub set on its own bottom. And it don't say nothing about the, uh, in the last days, you won't be able to tell winter from summer. You ever heard that? Yeah. I don't say it. It says as long as time remains, there'll be winter, summer, seed time, and harvest. Right. Always be the season till the Lord comes. But, you know, anyway, these old fool hall scriptures get passed around from place to place, and people trade them around, and they just say, well, I heard it down there, and I heard it over there, and I heard it out yonder. And by the time they get through passing it through 50,000 people, it's something completely different. Uh, than what the Word of God says. All right? The Bible says that he has a mark. What does that mean, preacher? It means he has a mark. They said, the Bible said he makes everybody take it. What does that mean, reckon? Well, I believe it means it means everybody take it. Uh, I believe it means what it says and says what it means and it's to be taken literally unless it shows you it's speaking in symbols. And when the Bible speaks in symbols, it always shows you what the symbol means. Uh, you see, if you come to the Bible and say, Good night, that might mean this, that might mean that. That's private interpretation. Every man's got his own interpretation. Yeah. And you get to the place where your guess is just as good as mine. Well, but you've got to let the Bible interpret itself, friend, right. and what it says about itself comparing spiritual things with spiritual. And so tonight we're going to look. We notice that this number keeps popping up. The movie, The Omen, number one and number two, recently came out with a little guy that was a real world dictator and it had on the advertisement, number 666. All the General Motors that they put out in Flint, Michigan during the past uh, a year ago uh, had the number 666 as a prefix to their uh, uh, numbers, serial numbers on those automobiles. Every ad tonight that drives a car in the land of Israel has his license plate number preceded by those numbers 666. You can see, they tell me, you can see hundreds of them over there. Then just any day that you choose to go to Israel. There's a new book put out in, in New York City by a man. And it named, put, it's published by the Kroll Company for Children. And it's an introduction to algebra for young kids in school. And the name of that book is 666 Jelly Bean. An introduction to algebra for the children. The W2P form from the IRS, 1977, has those numbers 666 on a certain uh, place in it where a person marks death, disabled, disability, whatever they might mark. And Mary Tyler Moore, as I told you this morning, had a TV special where a guy come dancing across the screen and with a devil suit on with 666 across his shirt. And you see stores all the time having these 666 sales. You ever seen them? Six on six six six. Anything on this table you can have. What is that, Brother Danny? It's the world being getting adjusted. It's the world being adjusted to that number. And when that number gets to look and see everywhere you go, it won't be such a big change when that becomes the final approval stamp of mankind. And brother, I believe, uh, no doubt, that it'll probably be that way. I'll give you one, brother. That might be a shocker too. You. you know, there's a word in the Greek language. Now, the Greek words always have a, a numerical value. Like, my name would be Danny. I, in English, our numbers like D-A-N-N-Y, they don't have no numerical value. But in Greek, their languages has a numerical value. That is, any word in the world you want to pick out in Greek, it's got a number that goes along with that name. Like, um, you take, um, you know, maybe those Roman numerals. Roman, you know, do the same way. You can take them, and you, you can spell out something, and you can add up what this letter means, and what that letter means, and what that letter means, and what that letter means, and add it all together, and you'll get a certain number. It's called geometria, or the ge geometric uh, value of a certain name. Any, any, anyone you want to pick out. And there's a false god worshipped years and years ago called Titan. And it's T-E-I-T-A-N. And brother, they, uh, it's where we get the word, believe it or not, Titan. And brother, that, this word, it comes down here and it passed over in all the Greek mythology and everything. Now originally, a tit the Titans were a group, a band of 12 people that, uh, 12 mythological gods, you know, that fought like a band and all that stuff. But that word came from that old, old, old god that was worshipped. And it was an old sun god that was worshipped. And brother, they worshipped it on Sunday. And its birthday was December 25th. And they worship these things. And brother, that's where we get our word Titan. And lo and behold, you have that word up Titan. And you wouldn't believe what it comes to. 666. Go Titans! 
Yeah. First time that's ever been said to Miss Lopez. <laughs> Look, you got, if you got the word right there on you, you ain't getting far from your plan, friend. That's right. Amen. Yeah. Six, six, six. But anyway, it said that he, had a, he was a king. And he went over the bottomless pit. And I'm not saying that's a mark of the beast. Don't nobody go out of here and say, I said a McDowell High School ring was a mark of the beast. I didn't say that. I said if they knew what God said about that name, they'd change it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I agree with that, brother. So the Bible tells us that he's a king. Now somebody's going to go out of here mad. And I'll tell you what you can do. You just go right ahead. Amen. 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 You know, you can't preach to please people. I found that out. I found out when I started preaching, if you try to please everybody, you'll make a first-class fool out of yourself. Some like it soft. Some like it loud. Some like for you to scream. Some like for you to stand back here and not make a move. Some like for them to put you to sleep. Some people like for you to put your collar on backwards. Some people like for you to, uh, to hold a book and just read a few uh, bunch of mumbo-jumbo and Latin or something, turn around like this. Some people like it like that. But I made up my mind after I started preaching that I was going to please the Lord and I was going to preach His Word, what He said, and the people can just like it, lump it, choke on it, spit it out, or whatever they want to do. Amen. Amen. You can't never please God and please people too, folks. Amen. Now, I'm not saying we're supposed to be a smart aleck. And if I believe the old hellfire and brimstone preacher's got a lot of love in their heart. If you don't believe it, you just ask them for help sometimes. But I want you to know, friend, that we're supposed to stand for this book. I mean, brother, if it cuts my wife's head off, if it cuts my mother's head off, if it cuts my little girl, brother, that's God's word. I can't help it. Amen. I'm going to tell you, brother, he has a king. He is a king. World dictator. We're going to look tonight. Where is he? Just going to spend a second or two on this because we've already read it. He's in the bottom of the pit. Where's he right now, preacher? I believe he's in the bottom of the pit. Yes. I don't believe he's walking around on there. I mean, a lot of preachers do, and I don't, you know, have no bone to pick with them there, but I believe that he's in the bottom of the pit. And I believe when the time's right, that's when he'll come out. Now, this bottomless pit is bottomless. Sometimes we think, open your Bible up to the book of Isaiah 14, and we'll look at something about this bottomless pit just for a minute. It is bottomless. Could there possibly be something like that that really didn't have no bottom? The Bible says that there is a bottomless pit. And when the Bible said it's bottomless, it's bottomless. It don't mean it's real deep. It means it's bottomless. And so the bottomless pit in Isaiah chapter number 14, I believe here when the Lord is talking to Lucifer, when he fell, you know, he was telling him about exalting himself to heaven and all of that. And the Lord said in verse 15, Thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Notice that verse, to the sides. It don't have no bottom, it just has sides on it. And the, and the Lucifer was brought down to the sides of the bottomless pit. And of course, that is where I believe that is that the man of sin is right now. And so we see in Revelation 17 and 8, have it he was seen, you know, come out of the bottomless pit. Let's look at that verse just a minute, and we'll try not to make you turn to too many more. Revelation chapter 17 and verse number 8. The beast that thou sawest, was and is not. Now that's a very important verse. You're going to need that verse before we get through tonight. It was and it is not. John said the beast that he saw used to be. And then it was not and then it was going to be. Remember that. He said it was and it is not right now and then it shall be. And shall ascend from where? Out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. How do you know who that is, preacher? Because what the last part of that verse says, And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Thou did behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Now, we're going to be looking at what this king is and this uh, beast, this antichrist is. We notice where he is. He's in the bottomless pit. As far as I know, from the Bible. Now, I'm going to give you a bunch of stuff here that's not in the Bible. I'm scared to do that. I'm not a Bible scholar. I don't claim to be. I doubt if I ever will be. But I do claim to read it. And I do claim to believe it. And I can tell you what it says. And just as long as it says it, then I'll be sure of my footing. And when it goes out from what the Bible says, then I ain't going to go out there too far. I just want to stay on what the Word of God says. So we'll come to this question tonight. The one you've been waiting for probably. Who is he? 
who is the Antichrist? The answer to the first question, where is he, is the bottomless pit. The final question we'll take tonight is, who is the Antichrist? <clears throat> I told you this morning, a lot of people believed it was Henry Kissinger. I mean, when Henry Kissinger first came out and he went around making peace all over the world, I, everybody just knew he was the Antichrist. And they thought, boy, there he is, peace, peace. Everybody said, there he is. And you know what somebody done? They got together and figured out that you can take Henry Kissinger's name, K-I-S-S, -S, and you've got to watch that word too, kiss. That's how Judas betrayed the Lord, brother. And, you, and that's also a very bad, other bad thing in these days. And brother, he's K-I-S-S-I-N-G-E-R, Kissinger. And they said he's the perfect man. Uh, he, he's going to go back. He's going to make peace. And he's Antichrist. But you know what? He turned out not to be him. You know why? Because he wasn't in the Bible. I believe it's revealed in the Bible where he's at. Anytime you leave the Bible and you go out here and say, well, I believe that or I believe the other, you're getting on dangerous ground because that's private interpretation. And the Bible says no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation, but holy men of old who of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And so never go out of the Bible to get your information. Stay within the covers of the Word of God. And they took the word Kissinger, K-I-S-S-I-N-G-E-R. I reckon that's how it is. And, and they took K. The letter K is the A-B-C-D-E-F-G-H-I-J-K. Letter, letter in the alphabet. And they added that up. And then they went around, you know, they added all the letters up in his name. And guess what it come out to be? 666. And it came out in Mr. Kissinger's name. And a guy showed me that and he said, look at here. And he had all that on paper and he said, Kissinger's Antichrist. I went, oh no, he's here. He's here. And it bothered me for a while, but later I found out, I thought, good night. Uh, my name might come out to be 666. Yours might. That don't mean nothing. Don't mean a thing. But you've got to stick with the book. Anytime you want to study prophecy... It's all right to look at current events. It's all right to hear the news. But if you want to study prophecy, you let the Bible interpret itself. I kind of got my doubts about all this mess these days that goes away off in the Bible. And they're going to prove this. and They're going to prove some biblical uh, something or another, you know. I just stick with the book, friend. I believe tonight, you know, when they found that thing they called Noah's Ark, I believe that caused a lot of people to have more faith in the Bible. I really do. I mean, I, I believe it was ark. I don't know what else a big old boat like that would be sitting up there on top of them mountains and all of that stuff. But I tell you something. I believed in Noah's Ark before they ever found that thing because I found it in God's Word. And if they'd never found it, I'd still believe in Noah's Ark. Amen. And I said, have, have Noah get all them animals in that ark. A guy, uh, I remember Brother Rutland telling about that, how did a guy come up to him and he said, how, how did God, I don't believe Noah could have got all them animals in that boat. And he said, well, how many animals was it? He, he didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> See how people are. Yeah. Oh, I just don't believe all them animals could have got in that boat. You don't even know how many there was. How do you know they couldn't got in that? Did you know most of the animals in the world are sea animals? And they didn't have to get in. They could swim. Right. And the rest of them, uh, about 70% of the rest of them, are little bitty tiny insects that you could probably put in this room right here. That don't leave a whole lot of animals. And the Bible he didn't have to take two German shepherds and two collies and two St. Bernards and, and uh, uh, two beagles and two strays. He just had to take two dogs. Every dog in the world comes from them two dogs. So when you start nutting it down like that, they have plenty of room to move around that ark. And then he said, well, I still don't believe that that ark. He said, I still don't believe he could have got all them in there. And Brother Redman said, how big was the ark? He didn't know that neither. <laughs> then that somebody, some educated man running his mouth. But I don't believe all them animals got in that boat. He didn't know how many animals there was. He didn't know how big the boat was. Until you find that out, son, just keep your mouth shut. Amen. Then you might be able to intelligently comment on the subject, right? Amen. After brother, you've got a lot of people these days just spouting off all this stuff and they're destroying a lot of people's faith in the Word of God when it ain't nothing but just a bunch of bologna. That's all it is. Yeah. But I'm here to tell you tonight that it's man, he is a king and he is over a kingdom. And his number is 603 score and six. I told you about this morning, that the revival that Superman's had, big old S on his shirt, stands for six. 
Now, he's super, you know. He's faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive, able to reach tall buildings than a single man up in the sky. It's a bird, it's a plane. No, it's Superman. You know what that is? That's getting the world ready for this man that really does step out on the scene, Mr. Superman himself, who says, I'm real, I'm real. You see what television and all that stuff does? It brainwashes people. You know what television will do to you? Here's the, de here's the devil's purpose behind TV. Here it is. I preached down there in another church. I preached out there preaching. I preached a conference fellowship meeting down there Friday. I went to it and they called over and got to preaching it. And we, uh, uh, he had a bulletin I really liked. He put his eyes on it and he put, TV will help you to grow closer to God. TV will encourage you to read the Word of God. TV will make you pray more. TV will make you a soul winner. TV will make you... And then that moment said, what is TV? Thursday night visitation. Amen. 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 But you know what television's geared to do? Television's geared to make you laugh and to make you just cheer yourself up. I heard that the reason they put out the little rascals was during the Depression time when everything was so bad they put it up to make people laugh and cheer them up a little bit. And did you know tonight that that thing has got people to where you can't get them to think serious? And everybody, everywhere you go out here in the world, boy, you're going to the shopping center, happy times, happy days, summer, day, back to school, everything's good, happy, happy, and it just makes you just, Whoa. that's the way it makes you feel. That music they play in them things, they some about, have you ever noticed that music, if you went into a shopping center and there was no music playing, you'd be nervous till you got out of that. Somehow or another you wouldn't feel like you'd just get on out. But when that music, about that balloon, about, they always play that song about that balloon. They drive up, drive me crazy with that thing. Would you like to ride? You know, that down and up. They always play that song. And you know what a song like that will do to you? It'll make you in a happy go, oh, I can afford that. Right? The first thing you know, you'll be buying a bunch of stuff you don't need. That's exactly what music, it's the same way in a restaurant. Do you know that? You go into a restaurant, you ever been in a restaurant where there wasn't no music playing? You feel nervous, you want to get up. And yeah, I heard a guy in a restaurant say one time that you can play that music in there, and those people would just eat right to that music. <laughs> and you know what he said? He said if he had a big crowd on Friday night, and the, pipe, the, the crowd was lined up outside, and he wanted to hurry up and get them through the line, all he did is just turn that thing up a little faster, and then people, oh, oh, oh. the first thing you know, they'd be eating right along with it. <laughs> they know that. People are advertising. They're after your dollar. That's all they're after. That's all they care about. I mean, you know, the love of money is the root of all evil. And everything is evil. Down at the bottom of it somewhere, somebody loved that bus. And that's why they're trying to do it. And they'll just lull, 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 lull you off to sleep. And the first thing you know, when somebody talks to you about God, you can't get serious. Right. All you want to do is just cut up and laugh. You go out and you try to talk to a bunch of young people. I'll hardly some more about the Lord. Right. Amen. It takes you 15 minutes to get them calmed down enough to where you can talk to them. Amen. I was the same way before I got saved. You stay all keyed up. Always running, moving, running, action, thrill, adventure. And the devil's purpose in that is to keep you a running and keep you a running till you die and go to hell and never do get serious and slow down and think about where you're going when you die. Amen. You need to slow down a little bit and check up on your life, see what it's becoming. Now the devil, the Antichrist, is a perfect counterfeit. Perfect counterfeit. The devil's job is to imitate. If you didn't know the difference by the Holy Spirit, you wouldn't be able to tell him and Jesus apart. Whether he imitates him, we'll show you from the scripture in just a minute. We notice that God is light, the devil's an angel of light. We notice that Jesus is king of kings. We notice that the devil is the king of the children of pride. We know that Jesus is God in the flesh. We know that Antichrist is the devil in the flesh. We know that Jesus has a bride. Antichrist has an old harlot bride. We know that Jesus quotes scripture. We know the devil quoted scripture. We know that Jesus' ministry lasted three and a half years. The Antichrist ministry will last exactly three and a half years. We know that Christ means anointed and false Christ or Antichrist means false anointed one. He's a counterfeit. He's trying to slip something in on the people to deceive them. And he has types in the Word of God. Now, we spend a lot of time maybe here at our church, maybe not enough, but a lot of time in types to studying here at our church. 
But most of the types that we study, most of the ones I preached on, is types of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that ought to be pleased. There's all kinds of types of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Like Joseph, when his brothers hated him, that was a picture of how Jesus, he came into his own, and his own received him not. And then he was hated by his brethren. They sold Joseph into the pit. And brother, they put him down there to be killed. And he, he was dead in a sense. And he went to the Egypt and got exalted to the right hand of the king. A perfect picture of how Jesus Christ was hated and betrayed by his brothers, the, eleven, the tribes of Israel, and was sold and done away with and exalted to the right hand of God in heaven. There's many types in the Old Testament. But the Antichrist also has types. There are men in the Old Testament that foreshadow and typify the work of Antichrist. Scripture, anything. <laughs> 